talk, well, both the pre-talk and the main talk are called some applications of group theory to the arithmetic of different varieties. So, what I'll do with the pre, what I want to do with the pre-talk is make sure that uh, some, of the most, some of the most basic structures uh, associated to abelian varieties are already on the board, and we have a chance to kind of uh, inhale them before we before we get going. So, um, in particular, some of the some of the notation that I'll need I'll already have in the pre-talk. I'll keep it here, and then uh, the unlucky people who don't get to be here will get ambushed with this notation. Start. So you guys watch ahead, sir. Okay, so K throughout this talk will be a number field, so it will be some finite extension of the field of rational numbers. Um, a lot of what I'm going to be able to do, what I'm going to say makes sense when taking K to be the rational numbers, but um, we'll see very soon that I need to consider more general K in order to be able to make some statements. Um, is going to, always going to be an abelian variety of uh, k of dimension uh, g at least one. Okay, so that's now let me fill in the part that isn't going to stay on the board, which is where our line of abelian variety is. Okay, so what is an abelian variety? <coughs> So it's a smooth, projective, connected uh, algebraic variety over the field K. You can also talk about abelian schemes over other bases, but in this talk, I'm only going to be working over number of fields. So I don't need to say more than that. Uh, so, I have a, so it's going to be smooth, projective, connected, and it has a group structure. So what does it mean to specify a group structure? Well, you have to specify the usual operations on a group, but you have to specify them so to speak in the category of algebraic varieties. So for instance, you need to have a multiplication map. So if I call this thing A for abelian variety, I need to have a multiplication map addition, if you want to, if you want to think of this thing additively. Um, so you have the group operation, which is a map from the product of A with itself to A in the category of algebraic varieties, uh, over K. Um, and likewise, there's an inverse map. So there's a group operation. There's an inverse map from A to itself. Um, and there's an identity, which is, well, in this context, I can just say it's a point. It's, a, it's some k-rational point. Um, if you're doing this in the relative world where you're working with some base team, this would be some section of the projection from A down to the base. Uh, and they satisfy the usual axioms of a group, so this has to be associative in a sense that you can imagine, right? If you, there are two different ways to write a map from the triple product <coughs> to A by composing in two different orders, and you want those to match. Um, now, it turns out, this is not immediately obvious, but uh, so I'm not, it turns out that when you impose these conditions, you automatically get something commutative. Um, so you can either include that in the definition or cite a theorem that you find saying in multiple principle kind of abelian varieties that this thing is automatically commutative. Um, so for example, things that do not come, things that don't show up as abelian varieties, so just to mention not an example, so not an example would be something like the general linear group. Right, the group of n by n, there's a, there's a variety consisting um, if you take so the affine space uh, consisting of, well, it's an affine space of dimension n squared, but if you think of it as the space of n by n matrices, 
and then you take out the zero locus of the determinant, that gives you something with a group structure by matrix multiplication, but it's not commutative, so <coughs> it doesn't, it can't fit this definition, and where it breaks down is, well, it's certainly smoothly connected, but it's not projective. It's in fact an affine variety. Unless n equals zero. Uh, so, so that's not an example, but what is an example? Well, we saw some in Kristen Lauder's talk yesterday, so let me remind you what examples we saw. So if E is an elliptic curve, i.e. a curve of genus 1 plus a marked point, which will serve as the identity, then uh, this, this, has a, this has a natural group law by this coordinate tangent process that Kristen illustrated. So, um, so for instance, for a more concrete example, if you take the equation of y squared equals cubic in x in P2 and sort of take the, the projective curve cut out by this, um, then you get an elliptic curve where you conventionally take the marked point to be the unique intersection of this with a line at infinity, which sits at zero and top. Okay, so that's our favorite type of example because it's sort of the easiest to work with. Um, but Kristen also mentioned some higher dimensional examples, um, such as Jacobians of other curves. So if C is a curve of genus G, then there's a there's a construction that well, originally it comes from complex analysis and was sort of migrated into algebraic geometry by Bay, <coughs> which associates it to an abelian variety of dimension G called the Jacobian. And so this the points of this you can think of as uh, uh, you could think, I guess you could think of this as like pick zero of, of C if you want. You can think of these things as sort of equivalence classes of degree zero divisors. Um, so for instance, if you have a point, I mean, a curve of genus, a curve in general doesn't necessarily have a rational point, but if you happen to have a rational point sitting around, um, you get a map of C to the Jacobian, which maps, well, maybe I, maybe I should call this point O for origin. Map, the point P will map to the divisor class of P minus so, if you're thinking of this way. So Kristen also illustrated this in her talk. So uh, she had the example of a curve of genus 2, and she was thinking of the points of the Jacobian as uh, being uh, divisors, uh, uh, degree 2 divisors. Uh, anyway, okay. Uh, let's see. So this should be reasonably familiar, but in case there are questions, I can still, still pause. Okay, well, let me get further into the story and see. Try to see if there are some more questions. So, so I'm going to write this example of the elliptic curve over here because I'm going to use some special feature of it to illustrate what's going to happen later. So we're going to be talking in this lecture about some sort of Galois theory for abelian varieties. Um, and to illustrate why there's some need for, the, for Galois theory for abelian varieties, I sort of want to remind you um, of a sort of dichotomy or trichotomy, depending on how you interpret it. Um, that's sort of famous in the, uh, in the already in the geometry and from the arithmetic of elliptic curves. Elliptic curves essentially come in two flavors. So what they curves with complex multiplication and curves without complex multiplication. I'll draw 
three lines here. I'll explain that in a moment. But for the moment, let me say that they're, they're elliptic curves come in two flavors. So what does it mean for an elliptic curve to have complex multiplication? OK, so uh, an elliptic curve is an algebraic group. So um, you can talk about the ring of endomorphisms of that algebraic group. Uh, in the category of algebraic varieties. And well, it makes a difference whether I'm, I'm looking at algebraic varieties over k or over an algebraic closure. So let's say I'm working over the algebraic closure. So I'm going to write e. Uh, so throughout this talk, when I have an abelian variety a, say, or an elliptic curve e, when I, say, when I write it by itself, I mean it as an algebraic variety over the original field k. And when I write some other field, like k bar, I'm going to mean the base extension to this. So, in this situation, I'm allowed to write down endomorphisms that are defined over this larger field. But if I don't say that, if I don't say that, then I'm only allowed to write down endomorphisms that are actually defined over that field. Um, and why does that make a difference? Because, well, think about this example. Let's take k to be q and take this elliptic curve, y squared equals x cubed minus x. Um, this does define a JSON one curve because the roots of this are distinct. Um, okay, so over so the endomorphism of this thing as an algebraic group variety is trivial. And trivial here means, I mean, because it's a commutative group, you can always, you know, double a point, and that's a well-defined homomorphism of the thing to itself, which you can compute algebraically. Or you can triple a point, or you can negate a point, or you can multiply it by minus 17. So, um, so the you always have endomorphisms that are multiplication by integers. Um, but in general, this will be this this could be some larger, uh, not necessarily commutative ring. Um, in this case, I'm not going to get a failure of commutativity, but at least going to get something larger. So if I go to um, the field, uh, sorry, this is the other one. Oops. This is the other, that's the other example. If I join the square root of minus 1 to, to q, then I get something which acts like a square root of minus 1, namely I get an, I, I get a I get a new endomorphism of thing, this thing, which is actually an automorphism. It's the map x goes to minus x and y goes to i times y, or i is some preferred square root of minus 1. And so that then I get a ring that looks like this as my, as my ring of endomorphisms. So that's why it makes a difference whether I write e or something larger because just because the just because the abelian variety itself can be defined over some field doesn't mean that you can see all of its additional structures over that same field. They, they may occur over some larger field. Okay? So, so if you go if you go to the full if you go but they can always be realized over an algebraic closure. You don't have to go to some weird transcendental extension to realize these algebraic structures. Uh, so this ring is either, in general, it's either the ring of integers, or it's an order in an imaginary quadratic field. So it could, for example, be the full ring of integers in some imaginary quadratic field, like this. But it could also be something smaller, like it could be the subring generated by 5 times i. And that can happen. Um, so, for example, if you read Joe Silverman's book on elliptic curves, you can find the proof of this. Um, there's a third option that can occur in characteristic p, which I'm not going to encounter here because, because k is a number field. So this is a field of characteristic 0. Um, so in this case, these are the only two examples. OK, so this is the case where you say e has complex multiplication. Um, why complex? Well, it's because this thing is imaginary, and it has to do with the fact that if you think of an elliptic curve, you know, over the complex numbers as being 
uh, analytically described as C modulo some lattice, then uh, these endomorphisms, these extra endomorphisms would correspond to you know, rescalings of that lattice by a complex, multiplication of complex numbers, you know, by some factor that maps the lattice into itself. So in this case, the lattice would be the orthogonal <coughs> lattice that you can rotate uh, by 90 degrees. Uh, so that's, that's the dichotomy here, except I want to distinguish further between whether or not you actually need to go to a larger field to find the extra endomorphisms, or whether you don't. Um, so, that, so it turns out that you either see everything over k, or you have to go to some larger field, which in fact has to be some imaginary quadratic extension. Um, so in fact, there are three cases, not two, uh, when you're working over a general number field. Uh, if, you th if you only think about the elliptic curves of the rational numbers, this case never occurs, because somehow, um, in order to, well, it turns out that this field actually has to be sitting inside k, because it, because you sort of see it, the, the tangent space of this thing is one dimensional, and this stuff acts on it by multiplication by the appropriate scalar. So, the, so that field with those endomorphisms of actually has to show up in the, in the base field. And so when you're over Q, this doesn't happen. So you only see these two cases, but in general, there are three cases. And I wouldn't be able to see all three. Um, so this talk is essentially about trying to distinguish these three cases and, and to make the analogous distinction for higher dimensional VLA varieties. Um, now, why would you need to make that distinction? Well, you can sort of imagine that pretty much all the arithmetic of the abelian variety is sensitive to this distinction. And just to give you a preview of the three themes I'm going to talk about during the main hour, I'll sort of mention, um, actually, the, this is something I'm not going to erase, so I'll put it on this board. Um, so the three themes I'm going to be interested in are uh, the field of definition of endomorphisms. So this question of where, what larger field do you have to go to to actually be able to realize the extra structures that are latent in your abelian variety? Um, Galois images. So this is a bit, so I should write down the notation uh, in, during the pre-talk. So if L is a prime, so what people think a lot about abelian varieties in terms of their torsion points. So, write this over here. So the, remember the dimension of A I'm calling G um, because, it, well I'm calling it G because in the case of a Jacobian of a curve, it's the genus of the underlying curve. So this might not, just because I call it G doesn't mean A came from a curve. Okay, if, if, if A is dimension G, then if I go to an algebraic closure, again, I'm going to emphasize that I have to do this over an algebraically closed field, and I look at the, the elements of this, the group of rational points which are of order dividing L to the M, this looks like a product of two G copies of the group Z bond L to the MZ. So you can see this from again from thinking about the analytic picture. If you think about AC as an analytic space, if you go all the way to complex numbers and you take the underlying analytic space, this looks like C to the G modulo some lattice uh, of rank 2G, and then this is this is clear. Um, Okay, so on this, I have an action of the absolute Galois group of K. So GK is going to be, GK is always going to know the absolute Galois group defined using this particular algebraic closure, say the one set of complex numbers. Uh, and the, 
And so G acts on all of these things. And it's conventional to put this stuff all together into what's called a tape module. So TL of A is, by definition, the inverse limit of these, well, maybe I should write this as instead of k bar rational points of A, take out the ones of order L to the M, and I take the limit, inverse limit where the maps are, you, you take a, a point of order L squared and you multiply it by L to get a point of order F. Yeah. So, and when you do this, you get uh, something that abstractly looks like 2G copies of, of the L adic numbers. with an action of GK on it. Um, and this carries a lot of interesting information about you know, where torsion points can be defined. Uh, so it's very interesting arithmetic information. Um, there's a long story of this, which I won't say too much about. But one other thing I want to mention is that I will often think of this not as a module over ZL, but I also want to extend scalars to QL. Uh, so VL will be TL. VL with QL. So now it's a QL vector space again with an action of, of ZL, of, of the absolute Galois group. And one of the themes is going to be, you know, how big is the image of that representation? If I think of uh, GK mapping to, if I choose a basis for this, then GK will map to the, the, to the set of uh, 2G dimensional Invertible matrices with QL coefficients, and I want to say something about how big is that, the image of that map. Okay, the third thing um, is sort of questions of equidistribution, and let me just show. And rather than I won't, I will say more about what this means in the main talk, but let me actually turn on projectors and show you what I mean. So there's a very visual sense in which you can, so I'll direct you to the projectors on either side and not to these internet ads, sorry about that. Um, I hope I can help this up without actually triggering the ads. Okay, so there's a sense in which you can actually visualize the distinction between these elliptic, between these three types of elliptic curves. Um, so for example, there's a sense in which this picture is typical for elliptic curves without complex multiplication. Um, I don't know if I can make this bigger. Uh, okay, I'm not sure if I can make that bigger. Um, so that this picture is, in some sense, typical of elliptic curves with complex, without complex multiplication. And this picture is somehow typical of elliptic curves with complex multiplication over the base field. Uh, well, it's, it's stabilizing, but let me not leave, leave this to do that. And this picture, not that picture, this picture is typical. Sorry, this is the one I just showed you. Uh, the third one, this is typical elliptic curves complex multiplication non defined over the base field. So. Uh, I will explain that this, but I think I, should, uh, I shouldn't record this explanation for just the graduate students, so I should let everybody in and then I'll explain this. So, so, let, so maybe I'll stop to see if there are questions before I continue. Uh, and if not, then we will uh, proceed to the main talk. 